Welcome to our Sunday morning invited session. I am uh, Torben Anderson from the Kellogg School at Northwestern, and I have the pleasure to invite you to join Jali, a prolific young scholar, but esteemed scholar, still prolific scholar from the Singapore Management University. Uh, Jali joined the profession with a PhD from Princeton in 2011. Uh, so he's actually only been really active for 11 years, given that he has an amazing amount of very good publications. Uh, he spent the first 10 years at Duke University, and he moved to Singapore last year. So uh, his formal title, I wrote it down, he's the Lee Kong Chan, Professor of Economics at the Singapore Management University. Uh, his uh, scholarship has been published in the primary journals in our discipline, including Econometrica, JASA, Annals of Statistics, Annals of Applied Probability, JBES, and Journal of Econometrics, many of them, and so on and so on. And uh, it's been an amazing uh, thing to see from the outside. I managed to meet Ja very early on in his career. I've been duly impressed ever since. He uh, started out within uh, Kind of the hardcore part of uh, the semi martingale framework that we use for high frequency analysis and he's contributed uh, greatly to that literature through jumps volatility functionals uh, he's done gmm with what we call integrated realized moments and uh, he has broadened out considerably in, in latter years to do uniform non-parametric inference in a variety of different settings and uh, I think we will see kind of a merger of some of those things today as well. Uh, beyond that, I got to know Ja uh, at many conferences, obviously, along, among the years. He's also been an extremely good uh, associate editor at the Journal of Econometrics for the last few years. And I really worship his uh, uh, dedication to do fair and solid decisions. Uh, you should know that journal editors pay attention to that when you were associate editor, even referee as well. And he's really one of the good guys uh, that takes his job very, very seriously. So uh, I have absolutely only good things to say about Jia, and I think it's awesome that we have him here joining us from Singapore. He can't be here in person, so we're doing this session remote. But without further ado, let's uh, move on to Jia, and I'll just give you the word, Jia, to take it away. Uh, thank you uh, a lot, Torben, for the so for the very kind introduction. And uh, of course, I would also like to thank the organizers for the invitation and you know, what effort for you know, making this work. And, and also want to thank you know, all the participants uh, in this event locally or remotely. And it's such a great honor to have an opportunity to give this talk. And you know, uh, as you know, uh, to, to talk about uh, my research. And as you can see, you know, this paper is about uh, optimal volatility uh, estimation. And this is a joint work with uh, Tim Bolderstaff, my, you know, long, long time colleague at Duke, and also Chi Yuan Li, who is our PhD student at uh, Singapore Management. So, of course, uh, I wish, uh, you know, like many others who are participating online, that I can be there with you uh, in Cambridge. But as you know, you know, there's a lot of, it's a special time and there's a lot of frictions uh, in, you know, all sort of things. But on the upside, um, you know, talking about special time, I would say this year, 2022, uh, is particularly special for volatility research. And the reason is that, you know, someone that is very important is going to turn 40 years old uh, next month. And that special someone, as you may have guessed, is uh, Arch. So as you can see, uh, the Arch paper was published uh, July uh, 1982, almost exactly 40 years ago. And next month, Arch will turn 40. So as you can also see from the title, right? Uh, the Arch paper was actually about United Kingdom. It's about UK. So that's why I think, you know, it's, uh, it's not only a, a, a perfect time, but also a perfect location to actually celebrate, uh, you know, the Arch paper and celebrate volatility research 
more generally and celebrate all the important you know, contributions made by everyone uh, in, the society, in the society. So today uh, is my great pleasure and honor uh, to, to talk a little bit more about what is the estimation. So uh, now let me uh, jump to the paper and explain the title uh, a little bit more. So the paper is about what is the estimation, um, which is of course a very important topic, uh, important for economics, finance, and you know all kinds of all kinds of practice. Um, so you now in this paper we are looking for you know we are targeting a number metric approach for what it is the estimation, and you know in the recent uh, years because of the increasing uh, increasing availability of high frequency data. So we have more and more data so that we can estimate volatility without making a lot of uh, assumptions. So that's why sort of number metric approach uh, is becoming more and more pop popular in this area. So in the you know, high frequency based volatility estimation literature, you know, number metric estimation can mean a lot of different things. And in this particular paper, uh, we are just going to focus on a pure number metric problem. Namely, we are going to estimate uh, the spot volatility, namely the volatility process at a given time point. So, you know, one important application for this kind of thing is, you know, you think about, you know, the time T as a policy announcement time, such, uh, such as the FOMC, but of course it can be other, you know, uh, other times. So more generally, you can think about estimating volatility for, you know, uh, for every single time point uh, in a day, and then use that kind of number metric estimator to estimate generalized, and so generally integrated volatility functionals to construct efficient estimator. So that is relatively well understood uh, in the literature. So that's why you know, we are focusing, although we are just focusing on the spot volatility estimation in this paper, it may have further implications in a more general setting considered uh, by others. So you know, that is the, the, the basic background and the, the key focus of this paper is about optimality. So optimality of course just mean, you know, what is the best way to convert input, including the data that we have in our hands and also what kind of assumption do we want to make on those data? So these are the inputs. And you know, the job uh, for the econometrician is to convert in the best way of this input uh, to output, namely our estimate for the volatility. So then you know, any analysis about optimality, of course, is gonna be special. It's gonna be specific for the data and the consideration and the assumption made on those data. So the data we are using in this paper is uh, the so-called intraday candlesticks data. So imagine that we have a very short trading session, for example, five minutes or 10 minutes. And within this you know, relatively short you know, intraday trading session, uh, we can have the open, high, low, and close prices. And these four prices you know, combined together give us a candlestick for that short trading session. So, and you know, using this kind of data to form an estimator is in the literature called the range-based estimation, although the estimator is not only based on the range, which would, which would be the difference between the high and the low, but it can also include you know, the open, close, and the uh, prices, and the usual return. So this is our data, and that's part of the input. And assumptions that we are going to make on those data is the standard Ito semi martingale type assumption. So I, I don't have too much to say about that. And the sort of harder work uh, is to try our best to convert this input to get the best estimator possible. And that is the optimality concept. So in this paper, we are going to take you know, optimality in a relatively serious uh, way. So we are going to take a decision theoretic uh, approach so at the end, the optimal estimator is going to be one that minimizes the asymptotic uh, estimation risk for a given loss function. So where asymptotic mean the usual infield asymptotic setting. Okay. So uh, just to make sure that everybody is on the same page, let me show you uh, a picture for a candlestick. Uh, so so basically, imagine you know we have a short trading session and the candlestick. Uh, is represented by this picture. 
So this is the, the, the open price, which is the first price uh, over the trading session, say 10 minutes. And the last price is the close. And within 10 minutes, there can be the highest price and lowest price, you know, uh, depicting the two endpoints of the candlesticks. Uh, so the color of the candlestick uh, you know, depicts you know, whether you know, the market is moving down or up. So we have, maybe have bearish uh, or bullish uh, candlesticks. So this is basically uh, our data, okay? And our job is to try to figure out what is the best way to extract information for uh, what is the estimation? Because obviously you can see that, you know, if the candlestick is large, what it is high, is small, and what it is low. But you know, what about the shapes, right? What about the, the size of the rectangle relative to the whole thing? What about the symmetry of you know, this candlestick? Are they useful information? And if so, what is the best way to extract information uh, from those shape uh, features? And that is uh, what we are considering theoretically uh, in this paper. So uh, what we are doing in this paper is really a practical uh, approach for thinking about optimal what is the estimation. So it's practical in the sense that, so what is a candlestick? So a candlestick is really, you know, a century old idea and maybe perhaps more than one century. Uh, you know, so basically practitioners use the candlestick as summary statistics for underlying, for the underlying uh, tick level data. So it's practical because you know, the estimators formed by using candlesticks are very transparent. It's, a, it's just a simple formula and you can compute your estimate for volatility. So it's very easy uh, to compute. And our analysis is basically providing an optimal solution for this you know, century old uh, practice based on these practitioners' uh, summary statistics. If we want to use you know, formal uh, statistical language to describe what is actually happening uh, in practice. So, but you know, from an academic point of view, one may ask why not working with the underlying tick level data because there are like a huge amount of tick level data. So, I mean, that is of course true. So we do have a lot of you know, data, tick level data, but the data itself, the data per se, are not going to tell us how to form a better estimator because you know, in order to form a better, to use the, those data and to extract information from the additional tick level data, one need to help them or impose additional assumptions. And very importantly, one better make sure that those assumptions are correct. So you know, if, the strong, if the assumptions are stronger than you know, after some hard you know, statistical work, let me get a sharper efficiency bound. But of course, you know, on the other side, you know, this, so this is really a, you know, a two-edged sword. On the other hand, you know, the challenge is that you know, what if uh, one question, you know, the correctness of whatever assumption we make on the t level data, in particular microstructure noise. So for example, there are many challenges that researchers are actively, uh, you know, uh, taking effort to, to address, including sort of what about the, the, the microstructure noise as a form of measurement error is non-classical in the sense that the noise may be correlated with efficient price, or maybe the relationship between noise and efficient price are, you know, uh, non-separable. So, you know, these kinds of complications uh, may sort of create a difficulty to uh, analyze sort of the, how to establish the, the most efficient estimator and try to uh, extract information from t level data. So in general, if the you know, assumptions are stronger, we may have sharper efficiency bound, but at the same time, the assumption may be less reliable. So, and these are a lot of challenges that we do not take uh, take on in this paper. As I said, in this paper, we, we, we are really taking a you know, more practical approach by just trying to first understand you know, how to optimally extract information from the relatively simple you know, candlesticks data. And hopefully the decision theoretic approach that, I mean, we, we, which I think is actually new to the high frequency literature may you know, shed light on, on future research, on, you know, those based on tick level data. So uh, I think this is a so very interesting sort of direction for, for future research. Uh, 
so the current paper is of course related to you know huge uh, uh, two strands at least um, of uh, literatures on volatility estimation. So one strand of literature is you know the larger li literature on high frequency based uh, volatility estimation. So I mean, um, so of course one topic in this literature is about you know non-parametric spot volatility estimation. So the current paper is actually about non-parametric spot volatility estimation, and it started with you know Foster and Nelson's econometrical paper, and around the same time, Cameron and Renault in uh, in this their paper also have an estimator. So uh, the other very important estimator is the semi-parametric estimation of integrated volatility functionals. So among which the most familiar one is integrated volatility. So you take the spot variance process and take it integral over a whole day. So that is the IV. But more generally, one can think about you know, integrated corticity or other you know, nonlinear you know, integrated volatility functionals. So there's a lot of in, important paper. So uh, for sure, uh, because of space, I'm missing a lot of important references, but there's, there, there's a few uh, important papers uh, on slides. So, but you know, more recently, we also know that these two literatures, you know, one is non-parametric, one the other is semi-parametric, they are really very closely related. Uh, because in order to form a semi-parametric efficient estimator for general integrated volatility functionals, actually one way, one known way um, in the literature is to first non-parametric estimate volatility process, and then you plug you know, those non-parametric estimator into the functional, you know, up, after some bias correction, one can show that that actually that kind of estimator attains uh, the semi-parametric efficiency bound. So Jack Calderon-Rosenbaum was the first uh, uh, among the first to to establish this result. So uh, one thing I want to say is to summarize the literature is that the literature mainly concerns how to use high frequency return state. Uh, as I mentioned, sort of the, the, the special feature of the current paper is try to use the candlestick data by using also incorporate you know, high frequency uh, high and lows. So that's why a very important you know, uh, a work related to our work is you know, Chris Tensen and Podolsky, they consider a range-based integrated volatility uh, estimator. But in our paper, we focus on spot volatility, but more importantly, we focus on optimality issues. Which is new. So the other, you know, uh, literature, uh, which is about range-based volatility estimation, is actually even earlier. So as you can see, you know, the, the, the two important paper, classical papers uh, in that area is actually before before Arch. So it's uh, published in the 1980. Uh, so they figure out, you know, from this literature, I mean. So the, the range-based estimator is still very popularly used in practice, you know, uh, in trading desk for you know equity and volatility trading. Uh, so the, the key message, the key message from that literature is that by using candlestick or range information can actually uh, substantially uh, lead to efficiency gains in volatility estimation. So for example, Parkinson showed that by using the, the, the high-low range, one can improve in, uh, uh, efficiency in what is the data estimation relative to return-based estimation by you know, five-fold. And the government class showed that by optimally combining uh, range and the return, uh, one can improve the efficiency, uh, efficiency gain uh, even further. So Garman class, the, the Garman class paper is particularly relevant for you know, our paper to understand our, so the, the incremental uh, contribution of our paper. The reason is in the Garman class paper, they actually establish a type of optimality. So remember that the, 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 the most important thing for the paper I'm presenting is about establishing uh, optimality result. So that's why Garmin class is very important reference. So that's why I, I want to spend a little bit more time to remind you uh, what Garmin class did uh, in their paper and what is their uh, optimality concept. So in their paper, uh, they considered a parametric setting where the log price is model, modeled as a constant volatility times a standard Brownian motion. So WT here is my notation for a standard uh, Brownian motion. So 
Of course, this is uh, before Arch, so volatility is constant. Um, so the gamma class estimator has this simple form. So it, the, the estimator is about estimating the, the, the variance, uh, so sigma squared. Uh, and the estimator is a quadratic function of three variables. So R here is the usual open to close return. And U here is the high return defined as the high price, the highest price minus the open price. And similarly, L here is the low return. So the lowest price minus open price. So basically the government class estimator is a quadratic function of these three returns extracted from the candlestick uh, observation. And the government class uh, automatically concept is that this estimator by using this particular you know, optimized ways is optimal in the sense that it attains minimum variance among or unbiased estimators. And also there's an important functional form restriction. So this estimator is by construction restricted within the class of quadratic functions as a quadratic function of these, uh, these variables. And this is, you know, gamma class optimality concept. You know, by looking at this uh, classical paper, by the way, it's an absolutely beautiful paper, uh, very, uh, very inspiring. And as mentioned, it's still, you know, very often, I mean, very popularly used in practice. But that being said, I mean, by looking at a the theoretical result, uh, one can see there are some limitations of their analysis. Uh, obvious one, uh, obvious one is that the stylized you know, uh, constant volatility model is unrealistic because when we work with high frequency data, continuous time, we know that volatility is you know, stochastic and it's changing all, uh, all the time. So that assumption seems to be unrealistic. But actually, if you, you know, think a little bit more, one realizes that it's not actually a big deal if instead of you know, focusing on estimating the volatility for one whole day, one can you know, consider the spot estimation problem by zooming in to a much shorter estimation window. So once we do that, you know, so you know, and, and there are some smoothness condition, right? So our short estimation window, then the constant volatility heuristic is going to hold uh, approximately. So this is actually a typical heuristic that we use to derive or to guide the derivation of our high frequency related uh, econometric procedures. So this obvious uh, critique uh, for common class is, as I just explained, is not actually a big deal once we instead focusing on spot volatility estimation, okay? So this heuristic was more, uh, in, well, it's used by many others, but in particular is used in uh, one of my previous paper. Um, uh, so, uh, based on, you know, also for range based on volatility estimation, yeah, high frequency setting. So, in that paper, as a byproduct, uh, we show that the gamma class estimator, when specialized, uh, when, when considered as a high frequency estimator, is actually the best quadratic unbiased estimator for the spot variance. And in that paper, we also show that we also construct a best, best linear unbiased estimator or blue for the spot volatility without taking, you know, or the standard deviation without a square. So the, that, you know, we follow a very similar, you know, construction and then figure out what is the optimal ways on uh, these features. Okay, so that is done uh, in previous work. But now today, what we want to do is to ask whether, you know, these functional form restrictions uh, quadratic functional form or linear functional form are actually hurting efficiency. So if that is the case, uh, by how much? So to provide a definitive answer to these questions, we have no choice but to derive uh, the unrestricted optimal estimator. So later I will write down you know, in explicit for, and in closed form, what is at the end the optimal estimator. It turns out that these, are, these estimators are not optimal. So the conclusion would be uh, the functional forms restrictions are actually binding, okay? So it's actually hurting efficiency. And by how much, it depends on what is the loss function. Sometimes it's large, sometimes it's uh, not that large. So that is, Basically, I'm just telling you the conclusion uh, of the paper. So now 
let me explain you know, how to reach uh, that conclusion. So the first step is of course to lay down the, the formal uh, decision theoretic uh, framework. So the estimate of interest uh, is going to be uh, the spot volatility to certain power. So the power P here is going to be user specified, you know, depending on you know, the user's empirical interest. So for example, if you're in, uh, interested in the variance, say for example, you're interested in you know, variance swap, so uh, that sort of things. So the variance would be the primitive. So it's very natural to consider P equal two. But if you're thinking about you know, high frequency uh, VAR kind of calculation, you, you're interested in the scale, the volatility. So it's natural to take P to be one. Uh, on the other hand, if you're interested in sort of portfolio related uh, problem, then the volatility will show up at the denominator for risk parity kind of you know, portfolio construction, one might be interested in the precision defined, uh, defined as one over sigma t, then p uh, is going to be minus one. So, uh, so depending on the situation, we may have different estimates. And just to clarify, I want to mention that for different p's, the optimal estimator is going to be somewhat different. So they are going to be derived from the same principle, but the format is going to be different. The reason is one, once we jump into a decision theoretic optimality concept, uh, the optimal estimator is not going to be invariant with respect to nonlinear transformations. So this is on the MLE, this is you know, uh, risk, uh, risk uh, minimizing estimator. So we do not have that sort of invariance uh, principle. So the estimator, the space of estimator that we are going to consider is a very general space. So basically we just you know, consider some generic function and this function is defined as a function you know, of these three returns, just like uh, in Garman class. But, but right now we, we are not imposing the function to be quadratic, okay? But we do want to uh, uh, make some slight restriction. Uh, to, to at least make sure that this is a reasonable estimator for volatility. And that restriction is that this, func this estimator should be scale equivalent uh, in the following sense, namely F should be homogeneous uh, with a uh, degree of, uh, with the degree P. So uh, that means, it just simply means that if we change the unit of the data, we, we do not in any fundamental way change the, the, the estimation procedure. So that's what you know, scale equivalent means, which is of course very standard for any you know, scale uh, estimation problem. So uh, you know, related to this, uh, we also need a loss function to gauge uh, the quality of the estimator. And for scale equivalent estimation problems, it's very natural uh, to use a loss function that is scale invariant uh, uh, loss function. So, I mean, for the same reason, because uh, when you change the unit, you do not want to uh, you know, uh, change the, the ordering of different estimators. So what that means, you know, scale invariant is just a scale invariant loss function just mean that the loss function uh, depends on the multiplicative estimation error defined as the ratio between estimator and the estimant. So L here is our loss function. So this in general, the loss of course in general is random and uh, the, the risk, the risk uh, related to the loss is the expectation of the loss. And this is the final sample, final sample risk. So at the end, we are going to consider a number metric uh, problem. Uh, so where you know, the returns are coming from uh, a Ito Semi-Martino model with a lot of number metric uh, uh, components. So that's why in general is, is just hopeless to, to precisely compute the final sample risk because of uh, the presence of all kinds of number metric, you know, unknown number metric uh, nuisance. But by invoking a certain, you know, the infield asymptotic result and, you know, developing a, what we call a coupling result, uh, it turns out that this final sample risk can be approximated by asymptotic risk, which is asymptotic pivotal. So asymptotic risk, as I will show later, is, not, is going to be nuisance uh, parameter free. So that give better hope, give us better hope uh, 
uh, to you know, derive uh, an estimator that minimizes the asymptotic risk. So that is uh, eventually going to be our proposed uh, estimator. So now uh, the formal uh, theory. So, okay. Uh, so of course we need, uh, you know, is uh, econometric work. We need some uh, assumptions. So uh, we assume that you know the the, the log price process P uh, is a standard Ito-Semi Martingale. That means you know it has this a stochastic a stochastic drift component, and the, the diffusion component is this stochastic integral of spot volatility integrated with uh, Brownian motion, and we also allow uh, for some jumps. Uh, standard model, okay. So we also need some assumptions and all the assumptions that we need is summarized on this page actually, um, you know, uh, you know uh, up to some standard you know, uh, localization. We are going to assume that you know, the relevant coefficients uh, in the model are locally bounded. So which is a very standard condition, regularity condition to impose for this type of work. And so the more important, you know, uh, in some sense, the more important uh, assumption uh, for non-parametric work about volatility is the smoothness uh, condition on the volatility process. So uh, this assumption is basically saying that the stochastic volatility process uh, under the L2 norm is kappa holder continuous, where kappa is some arbitrary small but fixed uh, constant. So it's worth mentioning that uh, you know, the typical assumption that you see you know, in high frequency of work corresponds to is a special case of this assumption with kappa being one half. And that is typically assumed because if the volatility process is driven by also a Ito semi martingale or a long memory process, this assumption is going to be satisfied with kappa being one half. But there's a recent literature, you know, advocated by uh, Gastro, you know, Jason and Rosenbaum, talking about volatility potentially being rough. So if volatility is rough, that means the kappa, you know, uh, constant is not going to be one half, but you know, far smaller than one half. So the typical number is like 0.1. So in this paper, we are not taking a stand on whether volatility is rough and what, it, what is the reasonable number for kappa. But you know, in our framework, we allow for you know, you know, ito semi martingale type, long memory type, and also rough type of volatility dynamics. So that is all allowed uh, in our uh, econometric work. So which I think is potentially important because the rough volatility model has been very popular. I mean, uh, in the recent uh, years, uh, you know, in the quant finance uh, community. Um, so to just formalize my notation for the returns, we have, you know, you know, a candlestick observation over a short sampling interval. So delta n is the length of the trading session. So, so in this paper, we are imagining delta n is five minutes, magical number, you know, five minutes or 10 minutes. And within this interval, we can define the open close return, the high return, and the low return formally uh, in this way. And the asymptotics that we are going to invoke is the standard in field asymptotics. So delta n goes to zero, and that's it. And that is, so we are using a single asymptotic framework. There's no bandwidth parameter uh, to be chosen as in kernel related work. So, okay. So one sort of very convenient piece of you know, theoretical device that we use is this uh, coupling device. So what he does is to link the original finite sample problem with a much simpler uh, limiting problem. So the finite sample problem is try to estimate volatility in a non-parametric model, but the limited problem is much simpler is a constant volatility model, you know, constant times the Brownian motion model. And in that model, we still talk about estimation of uh, volatility. It turns out that with a coupling, you know, argument, these two problems are essentially the same for our asymptotic purpose. So, you know, the formalization of that, that idea is uh, the following theorem. So, Let's, let's say we're interested in estimating volatility at a given time point t, and let i be the 
trading session, index the trading session that is closest to uh, the time point T. So basically we're talking about a nearest and neighbor type of estimator. And uh, recall that this is our estimator of general function uh, uh, written on the observed returns. I mean, the candlestick features. And we call this estimator regular if this function is almost everywhere uh, continuous. Basically, that is all the regularity uh, that we are going to impose on this function, okay? No functional form uh, assumption, but we need a little bit of uh, regularity. So the following theorem assess that uh, if we have a general, you know, regular and scale equivariant estimator, then the estimation error in this, you know, ratio form can be decomposed into a main term and a negligible term. The negligible term is containing you know, higher order uh, biases. So let me just tell you why uh, this is useful. So the leading term here, um, so basically you know, it is written in this form, but the nice feature of this leading term is that it's actually asymptotically pivotal. Namely, the asymptotic distribution is actually known in finite sample. So, the, uh, as a matter of fact, one can uh, show is it, is it, trivial to show that you know this variable zeta is in distribution uh, the same as the other variable, which is basically a certain functional of a standard uh, Brownian motion. So, b here is just a generic notation for standard Brownian motion. So, of course, you know the joint distribution of this vector is is non-standard, it's non-trivial to characterize, but it's known, it's nuisance parameter free. So that's why, so once we write down uh, uh, a candidate estimator, we, we actually know what is the, how to capture the asymptotic distribution of the estimation error. So as a result, as a corollary of, as an implication of this uh, coupling result, we can also show that if the loss function is continuous, then, the loss, the final sample loss, also uh, admits a, a similar asymptotic representation. So this basically is the limit loss, which again is asymptotically pivotal. So that if we define the asymptotic risk as the expectation of the limit loss, you know that risk uh, is also uh, nuisance parameter free. So you know in in, in English, what what you means is that. If we write down the loss function, for example, a quad quadratic loss function, if we write down a candidate estimator, then we can actually compute what is the asymptotic risk very precisely. So in other words, if we have you know, two estimators, F1 and F2, we can compute the risk and compare which one is lower. And if that is the case, that estimator is a better estimator. But, you know, uh, the job, I mean, the, 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 the task we actually need to accomplish is to find what is the best estimator. We are not just, just comparing two estimator, but we want to search for what is the estimator, what is the F that minimizes this asymptotic variance that corresponds to a functional, a functional minimization problem. And it turns out that this can actually be solved in closed form, okay? So uh, now let me give a formal uh, definition of the optimal estimator. So a regular scale equivalent estimator in this form is optimal or more precisely asymptotic minimum risk uh, scale equivalent estimator, or you know, because we love this estimator, right? Uh, a more estimator, uh, if it minimizes uh, the asymptotic risk uh, defined on the previous page. So you know there's some you know if you invoke some classical uh, you know decision theoretic result, uh, it's not hard to see that if the loss function satisfies some mild condition and this estimator the, the optimal estimator is going to exist and is going to be unique. So our job is to actually to just to derive you know the estimator in close form. So it's also interesting to know that because the asymptotic risk is nuisance parameter free, that means any estimator that is not, I mean, that is not the same as the optimal estimator because of uniqueness. If it's not the optimal estimator, it's automatically suboptimal. 
and because the asymptotic risk does not depend on any unknown parameter, then it's trivial to see that any suboptimal estimator e are, uh, is necessarily uh, inadmissible. It turns out that you know, the classical estimators uh, I mentioned before are uh, inadmissible uh, in this sense. Uh, the other thing uh, that is worth noting that is that you know, because the asymptotic risk is nuisance parameter free, uh, there's no need to introduce priors uh, in, and to compute Bayes risk because you know, those devices are really needed uh, to deal with nuisance parameters. So for the volatility estimation problem, we, we, we don't really need uh, those devices. But that being said, it's quite conceivable that if you consider more complicated problem, you know, since problem uh, may show up and I mean, it might be interesting to, to sort of entertain Bayes risk and the relate, related optimality concept. So uh, now, finally, let me start to tell you uh, what is the Armour estimator in closed form. So it turns out that um, the Armour estimator, I mean, the optimal estimator uh, only depends on certain shape related features instead of you know, color or direction uh, related features. So more precisely, uh, one can show that in the limit experiment, when the volatility process is constant and you know, it, the model is constant volatility times the Brownian motion, so that is a limit experiment. In the limit, the sufficient statistic for volatility uh, is these three uh, features. One is the absolute return, which is the, the size of the rectangle box or the real body. And the other is the range, which is size of the entire candlestick. And the third feature is a symmetry uh, measure. It's defined formally in this way. But what he means is that we take the upper shadow and the lower shadow and take a difference between these two shadows and then take absolute value of that difference. So that is a symmetry measure, okay? So it turns out that you know, the optimal estimator only depends on you know, uh, these three uh, features. And the closed form solution for the optimal estimator also depend, uh, depends on some not, not very commonly used uh, functions. So you know, we need to define this G function and H function which in turn is related to, to these uh, mysterious psi functions uh, with different you know, sub-index. So the psi function with sub-index Q is nothing but you know, the polygamma function of order Q formally defined as you know, certain derivative of the logarithm of the gamma function. So this is you know, the first time you know, I have to use the you know, polygamma function uh, in my work. And as search, you know, Google search a little bit, I mean, the only thing that can, the only application of the polygamma function I can find is in quantum field theory, which is a fun fact to mention, I guess. So, um, I mean, just to clarify, you know, when we construct our optimum estimator, we didn't know this would be the solution, but this solution comes indulgently uh, from the functional, you know, minimization problem. So with this notation uh, introduced, uh, the, this theorem tells us what is uh, the more estimator, namely the asymptotic minimum risk equivalent estimator uh, for the spot variance. If the loss function is Stein's loss, uh, so you know, it has this particular uh, form related to the G and H functions, and in particular, depends on a symmetry in this way, and also you know, the, the shape of you know, the relative magnitude between the real box and the whole candlestick in this way. And if you change the loss function to, you know, scale invariant quadratic loss, it has different form. So uh, it's interesting, of course, to compare uh, the functional form of these optimal estimators with the classical ones, including the common class estimator. The common class estimator, when written in the sufficient statistic, you actually have this ad additive form. And also the Parkinson estimator, which also only depends on the range and also the return, uh, purely return-based estimator, namely R squared. So in the literature, one knows that uh, government class is more efficient than Parkinson, is more efficient than return-based. So let's first compare, you know, uh, this functional form and to, to, to visualize, 
you know, how different are they? So this is the plot of these you know, estimators as a function of the absolute return, where we fix the range to be one and fix the asymmetry measure to be zero. So basically we are considering a symmetric uh, candlestick. So one observation is that, you know, the government class estimator is this curve, uh, is generally similar, behaving in a similar way as the two optimal estimators we are constructing for the stance loss and quadratic loss. And in particular, you know, when we fix the range to be one, as the return become larger and larger, you know, the volatility estimate is actually uh, dropping. But uh, on the opposite, so if we only one only use the return uh, as the information, then not surprisingly, when the return is larger, you know, the, the volatility estimate is larger. So it's behaving in the opposite way uh, to government class and also uh, opposite to our optimal estimator. Where the Parkinson estimate does not depend on return, so it's a flat line. So one thing we can say is that you know these estimators are actually different because of uniqueness of the optimal estimator. The difference directly suggests that the Garman class is suboptimal with respect to you know either the Stens loss or the quadratic loss. So we can also formally compare, numerically compare. So what is the asymptotic risk? So and, you know computed from our theory for these different estimators because of the end of time, let's just focus on uh, the quadratic uh, risk. So this is the, the risk for the common class estimator and this is the optimal, the risk of the optimal estimator, which is notably uh, lower than common class. So, I mean, that give you a sense about the, the efficiency uh, improvement in terms of quadratic risk. Uh, so in summary, um, the, 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 Armor, the optimal estimator is about 30% more accurate than government class uh, under the quadratic loss. But uh, interestingly, when you know, the stand, uh, stance loss, um, uh, so when we use the stand loss to construct the Armour estimator, that estimator is also asymptotically unbiased. And that estimator, although not trying to minimize quadratic risk, it turns out that that estimator also have a smaller quadratic risk than Garman class. So because of these two results, uh, we know that as a byproduct of our optimality construction, we know that Garman class estimator is suboptimal and hence inadmissible, and they're both a quadratic loss uh, with or without unbiased uh, restriction. I mean, uh, of course, to clarify, you know, we are not trying to, you know, say bad things about Gamma class because it's a very beautiful estimator, it's very practical, very elegant. Uh, but, you know, but as a byproduct of our optimality analysis, it turns out that this estimator is not the best one could do. Uh, but on the other hand, if we compute the loss using Stan's loss function, it turns out the gamma class estimator is, is nearly optimal with a 2% margin. It's nearly as uh, optimal under Stan's loss. So in the paper, we also have additional results for deriving in explicit form, uh, what is the optimal estimator for volatility without taking a square? So under Stan's loss, the optimal estimator for volatility itself is this. And, and the quadratic loss, it has a different shape. So this implies that my own estimator uh, in this paper, uh, which we you know, call the okay estimator in that paper, but it's actually a blue estimator, best linear estimator, is also uh, suboptimal. So uh, government class is not the only victim, um, myself also, uh, and hence, but the data estimator is also uh, nearly optimal under uh, stance loss, okay? So for precision, we have a similar result. So I'm running out of time. Uh, so in conclusion, in conclusion, uh, what it, uh, in this paper, uh, we propose a decision theoretic framework uh, for studying optimal what is the estimation. So, you know, this, this word, this, this word is my favorite part of the paper. I think introducing uh, some decision theoretic principle uh, in uh, high frequency work, you know, in, in especially in what it is estimation, I think it's a very interesting direction uh, for future research. And to show this can be done, we, we construct optimal estimators uh, and their commonly used uh, for commonly used volatility measures and loss functions and as a 
as a byproduct, we show that the classical estimators are suboptimal and inadmissible. And there are many open questions uh, related to you know, this kind of decision theoretical approach. So for example, in so one elephant in the room is that, is, is that possible to use this kind of approach to study volatility and or noise with noisy tick level data? I think that is the fan, you know, ultimate pursuit uh, of our, you know, in this area. And what about, you know, you know high dimensional, I mean, multi-dimensional or even high dimensional uh, situations for estimating beta, it is credit variance or eigenvalues. And what about jumps? And more generally, you know, once we have a more complicated problem, it's very likely that, you know, non-estimatable uh, nuisance parameter is going to show up. You know, if you're familiar with the literature and look at these topics, you have a sense that it's it pro probably going to show up. In that case, one idea may be to use, you know, optimal Bayes and uh, Bayes uh, decision rules, which is, you know, get, you know, popularized recently in the you know, application literature, where a similar problem shows up. So that's what I have to say uh, for this talk. And thank you very much uh, for the attention. Yeah, I really like the talk and the research is great. So the Stein North is new to me. Uh, usually for many um, North locally, they usually behave like quadratic, right? Is that what you think about locally? Is that Stein North? Because Stein North kind of, so my, my question is, why pick up Stein North, uh, say compared to quadratic? Should I answer this now, Torben? Please, yes. Is that Xiao Hong? Yeah. Yes, <laughs> hi Xiao Hong. Um, uh, Stein North, of course, locally, I mean, a lot of things locally are quadratic, but here uh, we are not considering a, a quadratic, I mean, local problem. So, I mean, this is really a more in the sense of, you know, a finite sample characterization. And, uh, you know, it's not only the local behavior, but also the global behavior of the loss function is irrelevant. Uh, Send loss, of course, is defined in this way. And it's actually a very uh, standard loss for in the classical, you know, uh, uh, decision theoretic based uh, estimation problem for scale parameters. So one beautiful thing about Stanislaus is that uh, the MRE or asymptotic, you know, the, the Amor estimator based on Stanislaus is automatically uh, asymptotically unbiased. So this is a special feature for Stanislaus, which is not shared by other loss functions. So as a matter of fact, uh, Brown in his, in his paper uh, in 1968 actually showed that uh, Stan's loss is, you know, up to I, I find transformation is the only loss function such that the resulting risk minimizing estimator, the optimal estimator in this sense, is uh, unbiased. So that's why Stan's loss is very special for scale problems and also for uh, decision theoretic uh, related, you know, analysis. So it's very popular used in scale uh, estimation problems if you if one take a look at, you know, Lehman's book, uh, you know, uh, theory of point, uh, point estimation. Yeah. Uh, hi, Jia. Uh, thank you very much uh, for a very interesting talk and some uh, impressive results. Uh, my question is, is uh, I guess, uh, coming from non-parametrics, there's a few things that I, I didn't hear you talk like, um, you have a class of functions where the smoothness is varying uh, and usually we think that's a very difficult uh, problem to achieve adaptive estimation across the function class. Um, so that's that's one aspect of it. Uh, a second aspect is you're restricting attention to data from your particular trading window. Um, and from a non-parametric point of view, you might say, well, if that's my core data, I should look at cons you know, consecutive trading windows, so nearby trading windows. And whether that would that would bring back a bias variance trade off, uh, and 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 I, the other thing I didn't hear you talk about was rates of convergence. So across this function class, you must have quite different rates of convergence, right? So, you know, maybe this brings the. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, thanks for the question, Oliver. Uh, so, and uh, this. Uh, this this paper is you know the the framework is based on 
uh, something you know we, we re I recently developed uh, with team and you know and and the Zhipong and Zhipong Liao from UCLA, which will call a, a fixed K. Uh, fixed K um, uh, framework to think about, you know, non-parametric estimation and inference for volatility. Where K means that, so plays the role of the usual, you know, bandwidth parameter that you probably have in mind. So of course, in the, you know, older, you know, you know, you know also including my previous work, uh, when we do spot volatility estimation, we choose the bandwidth parameter K and let K to be, go to infinity, but not too fast, right? In that case, we can invoke law, law of large numbers and standard central limit theorems to derive consistency and uh, asymptotic normality for the inference. But recently, we, we found, you know, found out the other alternative way to think about non-parametric inference, where we fix K. So in that case, uh, we just very heavily exploit the local Gaussianity of the Ito-Sam and Martingo model. Basically, the distributional result is coming from the Gaussianity of uh, the Brown emotion. So without invoking the extra layer of asymptotics by sending K, the bandwidth, to infinity, because we do not need to use that layer of Gaussian approximation. Gaussian Gaussianity is already here uh, in the Brown emotion. So it's a different framework. That's why you don't see me uh, saying about talking about bandwidth. And of course, there's a theoretical cost. By not pretending K going to infinity, we lost consistency. And, and hence, there's no space to talk about uh, rate of convergence. But I mean, as we are showing in a previous paper, even in that case, we can still talk about valid inference, which is based on more like the finite sample distribution of whatever estimator we are constructing. And in this paper, we are taking that idea one step further to not just talking about uh, you know, constructing confidence interval, namely inference, but we talk about optimality and bring this all the way to a decision theoretical uh, you know, risk minimizing uh, framework. That's why, you know, the flavor of this paper by, by, by invoking this fixed K, actually, we are taking K to be one here, but we invoking this fixed K framework, we are more in line with the traditional, you know, finite sample analysis. But of course, in order to get there, we need this coupling result to bring the gap uh, to, 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 to really eliminate the gap between the non-parametric problem and the limited problem, which is parametric. So I think this partially answers your question. And the other thing that is worth mentioning is that, so one, once we want to, if we want to you know, sort of accommodate this rough volatility concept, meaning that we do not have a lot of space to assume that the unknown function, well, in this case, the volatility, is very smooth. So imagine that you do number metrics, but with a little bit holder continuity in the underlying function. In that case, in the standard intuition, the optimal way to do it is to take a very short uh, estimation window. Short to the extent that it's almost fixed. So that's, that is why in our framework, we can actually handle uh, arbitrary rough volatility. So basically this is how everything you know, come together. So by, by, by using this fixed K framework, you can handle rough volatility uh, and also you know, find a sample analysis and the decision theoretic, decision -theoretic uh, optimization uh, result. Uh, thank you for that elaborate answer. It's absolutely fascinating actually. Let's see, there's more questions. I think Rob has one, so. Um, yes, uh, this is Rob Engel, hi. Uh, I wondered if some of the intraday events that we know and expect are uh, problems here. For example, there's a, a definite time of day shape of volatility, uh, sometimes called seasonal or diurnal effect. And, uh, the, but in addition, there may be time varying volatilities within the day. I, I realize you can divide the day up into many pieces, but then, uh, there are issues as to how, how you would do that. Um, and secondly, if you could just uh, confirm what I suppose is true, that if you want to measure close to close volatility, you would just use this estimator plus uh, 
a close to open uh, squared return or something like that. Oh, thanks for the thanks for the question, uh, Rob. Uh, so, so actually, one of the key motivation for thinking about so, as I mentioned, you know, uh, taking the estimation window to be short is exactly uh, what you just mentioned. Basically, because the the, the volatility is, is moving, if you take a long window, maybe within the estimation window, the volatility is you know changing too much. Where if that is the case, then the usual heuristic underlying you know, or the number metric estimation technique is going to break down because essentially the first order intuition is that when the bandwidth is short, you know, you know the unknown uh, become constant. In this case, volatility uh, become constant. So in order to address that, that kind of bias issue, one would, I mean, if really, one really cares about this kind of bias issue, the natural thing to do is to make the window as short as possible. And this is exactly what we are trying to do here. Of, of course, there's a cost, you know, you can not try to use a lot of large numbers because window is too short, and such a limit theorem, but we have a, we have a way uh, using this coupling concept to address that. Um, I think so. During the morning, definitely volatility is going to change uh, to be changing very fast. Of of course, during you know major news announcement, it's going to be uh, changing uh, very fast as well. So I think by taking the window to be short, uh, is uh, the estimate will more will be less biased than uh, another alternative with a longer window. So that's uh, what I can say. Um, on the other hand, so if you consider sort of close to close uh, 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 a return based on volatility, and of course that is a particular way. You know, close close is basically uh, the sum of, of you know different pieces features of this candlestick. Um, I, I I think that is not directly the optimal way to do things because you know, the sufficient statistic uh, is actually the individual features and the optimal way is to combine this uh, according to our formula. Um, so maybe that you know, partially uh, answers your question. Uh, I think we soon have to end. I will take the uh, uh, provocative of the uh, uh, person in charge to ask one final question. If, if we have time, Andrew, I think you, okay. So, so uh, as you make the window smaller and smaller, you, you very rightly commented in the beginning that uh, you know, rain space is less sensitive to noise. If you started doing the high frequency data, you'd have to deal with the noise. But as you start shrinking the windows, uh, noise comes back into the you know, consideration again. And you, you know, intuitively, if you use very short intervals, uh, bid ass bounds and other things actually get pretty important for, for ranges over short intervals. So uh, I know that you probably did all of this ignoring the noise and said that's a future uh, topic, but do you have any reflections on, on how to currently apply your, your theory in the context of, of real-time data? So, um, so one uh, practical su sort of su suggestion is, um, to notice that if one is feeling comfortable using, say, for example, five minute returns data, uh, you know, by ignoring you know uh, microstructural noise, then by using the range which is you know contains a uh, higher signal, uh, one should you know feel reasonably comfortable to you know when incorporating range uh, observation to ignore microstructural noise uh, as well. I mean, uh, uh, and to some extent. Uh, Approximation, of course. So one device to do that is to look at uh, signature plot, which can be done uh, also here. So the other thing that I want to say is that um, one can always use, you know, the clever idea, you know, by uh, Miklan, Zhang, and Yasin. Uh, that is, you know, the subsampling and then averaging idea. One can, you know, use relatively coarse windows to construct the, the candlesticks apply this estimator and sort of shaping, I mean, uh, shifting uh, the candlestick construction over you know, a higher frequency data and then take an average. So actually, you know, with some work, I mean, this uh, uh, kind of you know, strategy and estimation uh, framework can be extended uh, to that kind of construction as well. So that is a very you know, convenient way to extract more information from the underlying 
uh, peak level data without explicitly uh, having to deal with uh, the challenging question of you know, what is the right assumption uh, on noise, right? Because once we start to talk about optimal estimation, it's really about the mapping of assumption, one assumption mapping to a particular efficiency bound. So in that case, you know, what kind of assumption you write down on, in the first page is very, is very important because you directly dictate the efficiency bound, which is a little bit different than just deriving a central limit theorem. So I think, you know, again, it's, it's a very important question. I think uh, a lot of effort uh, should be spent uh, on those kind of issues, uh, you know, how to, you know, get more efficient estimator using all kinds of, you know, t -type data. Thank you indeed very, very much. Uh, it's amazing how you can develop deep theory about very old questions that we thought we already kind of understood. So. Uh, absolutely fascinating, and please join me in thanking Jali for this fantastic presentation. Thank you. Thank you all.